So again, I know you're not here for me, you're here for Jake and Gino, so why don't we give a big round of applause to our guys that used to be from New York, Jake and Gino. So this is this is Dylan Marma. This is our head of investor relations. Dylan, what do you want to say to the world? Man, I'm excited to be here. You, you see this? Look around us. We have a giant city. We have a lot of people. We're gonna have 200 people in the event tonight. We're gonna bring the energy. We're gonna bring the noise. We have the bird here, ready to share the good word. I'm gonna be sharing the good word on investor relations. We're gonna talk about LPGP splits, and uh, they're gonna learn, man. They're gonna be excited. And at the end of the day, what's it all about? It's about freedom. Real estate creates freedom. That's what we're talking tonight, folks. Katarina came to me and she's like, do you know Jake and Gino? And I was like, no, I don't. And she's like, you really should get to know these guys and, and you should get them here to a meetup. And it's, it's literally taken us a number of years to actually make this happen. And when, when you find out about what these guys have done in the short period of time in their lives, gone from zero to almost a thousand rental units, controlling over $50 million in real estate, They've literally set themselves up for life over the last, was it, seven, eight years or so now? Uh, five years. Five years. So if they can do that over the last five years, imagine what you could do over the next five years by having someone like them come teach you exactly what it is that they did. You can capitalize on, on their experience. So again, I know you're not here for me, you're here for Jake and Gino, so why don't we give a big round of applause to our guys who used to be from New York, and Jake and Gino. Thank you so much for coming. This is how I started my real estate business. Um, right? I'm in the kitchen, 2011, I'll never forget it. I met him, and he wasn't even my friend, he was my brother's friend. So I'm sitting back there, and I'm really pissed off at myself. I'm pissed off at the world, I'm pissed off at my life, right? And I wasn't a life coach yet, didn't know what I wanted, right? I was really, I was really upset with what was going on. And, you know, being a man of faith, I said to myself, God put me here for another reason other than being just a miserable person. We all have potential. All you guys out there have massive potential. And I wasn't living up to my potential. And to me, that was sinful. To me, that was killing me. I didn't know that at the time. But I said to myself, I'm here for something better, right? Uh, talking to the mic. Let's get this cranked up, fellas. Here we go. Let's go. So this is, this is my boy, the G-Daddy, right here. Everybody loves the G-Daddy in their life. And I was really close friends with his brother Mark, like he alluded to. We went to Yankees game again this weekend. G did, man of faith, he had to skip on that one, right? He wasn't going in with the boys at one night. But uh, going to the restaurant, I was a pharmaceutical rep, did a lot of catering through the office. 
and this is this is no bullshit. G, G don't sit in the back of the room like this all the time. I was upset. I'm like, Mark, what's wrong with your brother, bro? What's up with this dude? And uh, he's just, yeah, yeah, he's okay. Guys will call in. Oh, I can't do the dishes today. Oh, the chef will call in. Oh, I can't do this. So you got a guy here who starts a business and quality Italian food, okay? This is amazing. And you got the guy that owns a restaurant. Who's going to do it if he doesn't? Dishwasher doesn't, sh dishwasher doesn't show up? Gino's a guy. Cook doesn't show up? Gino's the guy. I'm getting sad because I'm thinking back at it. Oh, we don't want you to cry tonight, okay? We're not, we're not, we're not shedding tears here. This is a good thing. It's, it's getting me a little annoyed because at the time, I'm thinking to myself, I'm better than this. We're all better than this. And I wanted to help people. I wanted to grow. It wasn't about financial freedom at the time. It was just doing what I wanted to do, liking. And I liked it 10 years ago. Before the economy crashed, I liked it. I was working with my dad. It was fun. But then it just became a certain part of my life that I'm not spending time with my kids. Christmas Eve, I can't go to church. I have to work 16 hours. That sucks. It sucks after a while. So my point to that is you have to figure out what your why is. My why was I wanted to spend more time with my family. I wanted to become financially free. But why to become financially free? Why multifamily? We're all here about real estate. But what is real estate going to do for you? What it did for me was I became financially free. The three things I talk about, the trinity, work hard. We all work hard. I was working my ass off. Once you work smart, like we did, we're going to show you the multifaceted the multifamily. I became financially free, right? I could do what I wanted to do. I moved down to Florida with six kids. You know how hard that is? My wife wanted to kill me, but I said, you know what? There's a reason why I want to come down there. It's quality of life. And the third one, work with passion. That's what I do right now. I love it. I've connected with a lot of you guys out there. I love talking about real estate. I love being a life coach. And that's what it's all about for me. Where, where's my boy Raymond? Where's he at here? Dude, we were just talking about it a minute ago. It's about freedom, guys. It's about taking control and being able to dictate your lifestyle and not being dictated to by somebody else. That's what we're here, I think, I hope, that's my why. I hope every single one of you are here because you want to take control, and that's what multifamily's been able to do for us. So, simple so, as that. So for me, I became a life coach, not because I wanted to become a life coach, but because I wanted personal development. Uncle Sean's gonna get mad at me if we don't start doing this, all right? So. And I think you all have to work on personal development. That's the first thing. We all have to work on ourselves. We have to invest in ourselves, right? The first thing I learned about, there's four energy blocks in this world. What's an energy block? Anything that is external is not an energy block. It's all internal. So back in 2008, let's rewind, going through it. I'm blaming Obama about the economy. I'm blaming Bush. I'm blaming everybody. A lot of guys out there making millions of dollars. I'm not one of them. I took control, went to school, started educating myself. The four energy blocks. The first one is a limiting belief. Anybody have any limiting beliefs out there? You got tons of them, right? My limiting belief was money. It takes money to make money, right? A bunch of crap. Because all you guys out there are syndicating deals. It's not your money. It's someone else's money. I'll give you a quick example. I pulled into my house uh, yesterday morning, my mom's house. She's got grass. Everyone's grass is green, beautiful. Hers is brown. I'm like, mom. What's going on? And she says, you know, the landscaper, if I fire him, the next guy's going to come along and do the same thing. I said, Mom, that's a limit. I'm trying to tell my mom she's an Italian lady, seven years old, about limiting beliefs. She thinks I'm crazy, but it's true. You're try I said, Mom, get rid of him. Gone. But her limiting belief is, if I get rid of him, the next guy coming is going to do the same thing. It's a limiting belief. So I told her, unless you shatter that limiting belief, it's going to hold you down. And that's what happened at the restaurant. I thought being comfortable was great. You know, being safe, secure job, that was my limiting belief. But once you shatter those limiting beliefs, your life is just going to change forever. The second one is the interpretation. An interpretation, give you an example. This guy was giving me emails two weeks ago on a Friday. They weren't coming to me. They were going to my spam box. I'm like, this jerk. Where are my emails? I want to get my Friday reports. I could, have, I could have interpreted it in a bad way, right? But actually reached out to him. It was my interpretation. I wasn't getting them because of the spam box. So every time we do something in life, it's an interpretation. You can interpret it in many ways, right? It's not what people say. It's not, let me, let me give you the quote. What people say is about them. What you hear is about you. Mm -hmm. Take that away, guys. That's really, really deep. I learned that in life coaching school. Jake, what's up with the jacket? He can say, dude, you don't like my jacket? I, I like the jacket, nice, but it all depends on how it's coming from him, right? But that's what I'm saying. That's an interpretation. The third one is an assumption. Now, this one was really hard for me because when I first started out, a lot of you guys started out, I lost money in my first couple of deals. I lost a lot of money, right? But what did I do? I could have assumed that 
real estate's risky. I could have assumed that it's not for me. What I did is I buckled down, I knew what my why was, and I went after it. Because I wanted it really bad. I wanted the financial freedom. I wanted to move to Florida. I wanted to walk on the beach yesterday morning like I did. I wanted to spend time with my kids at nighttime. That's what I wanted. So my why was strong enough. I didn't make that assumption hold me. A lot of you guys are in relationships. You get mad, divorced, you break up. You're going to assume the next relationship is the same. It doesn't have to be. You can break that assumption. And the last one is the gremlin. The gremlin is the big one. We all have it. That little voice in your head. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Flesh it out because that's a bunch of crap because we're all in the same same boat, same position. So worry about those four energy blocks. If you can work on them, work on yourself, you guys can do anything. Trust me. For those of you guys that maybe listened to us in the past, anybody familiar with MIH? Put a little bit of a little make it happen in the room. Uh, Gio forgot to tell a little bit about the, uh, the rest of the story last night and about his mom because we had a nice event last night, a lot of good folks like this, and uh, he bailed on me. The G Dad bailed on me last night because he had to go back to the restaurant because mom was waiting. So he left that little part out of the story. You know, um, it's really good. But uh, I want to invite a few guys up here, Dylan and Josh, because multifamily is a team sport, okay? And what you guys are going to find out as you start to scale, as you start to grow your business, you need to find the right people. You got to bring on eight players. And I want to I want to introduce introduce these guys real quick because. We want to get around, we want to speak to everyone tonight. If we don't get an opportunity, uh, we have Dylan Marma. He's the head of our investor relations. We're going to talk a little bit about multifaceted multifamily tonight. So if you guys have questions about syndications, uh, you know how to, how to get deal flow, he's the guy. We have our community director, Josh. If you want to learn about the most multifaceted business, how to bring more businesses into your life through multifamily, he's the guy. So they're going to be out there. If you guys want to catch up with them, they're part of the crew. And again, it's a scalable business, and you need to learn how to bring the right guys on board. So we'll catch up with you guys in a little bit. Thanks. If you guys want to start with the slides, you can start clicking them. But another limiting belief that I had was you have to stay small. I had one restaurant, right? One location for 20 years, and I was good. I, I was. I was a good cook. I was really good. You can see my cooking videos go on Gino's Trattoria. I was really good. I enjoyed it, but I didn't know how to scale because I was setting that mindset with my mom saying, we have to stay small, we have to take it easy, we can't take too much risk. How in five years will I have 900 multifamily units? Because I shadow the limiting belief because you can do it, right? So to me, that was important. I mean, the limiting beliefs go on and on. How do I got these guys work with me? Look at the partnerships. The partnership is amazing. I never thought I could partner with somebody like Jake because everyone always told me, getting a partner is risky. You just have to know what to look for in a partner. And hopefully we can teach you, we can show you how we've grown our partnership because it's all about networking in real estate. No, no one has BLC. You. Your network is what? Your net worth, that's true to its core. You will not be able to multifaceted or multifamily. You will not be able to grow other businesses by yourself. If you want to get burned out, you can, but you'll never be able to do it. So let's talk about these a little bit. Everyone's out there, oh, partnerships, oh, I don't want to do it, what if the guy's a loser, this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> it's true. I'm not here right now if it's not for him. He's not here right now if it's not for me. So we're going to go, we, we've basically got so many questions from folks. What's a partnership look like? How are you guys doing it? What makes a good partnership? We, we came up with five core things here that lead to a good partnership, and I want to start with the first one. Having a similar moral compass. You know, hit all five. Back up one. Because the key takeaway here is that I want each and every one of you, you can use ours, but I want you to think about it because tomorrow if you say, I want to go out and I want to partner with somebody, I want to start to grow this because I know that I can't do everything, these are the things you need to look for before you start looking for net worth, before you start looking for liquidity. So number one, when you partner with a GDAD, you know you're getting a good moral compass, right? You don't want to you don't want to partner with the Bernie Madoffs out there, okay? You want to give with a guy that is honest, integrity, okay? He's 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 obviously a provider for his family, and that's that to me was the first you know point. It was like I've never had a partnership, but I know if I'm partnering with this guy, he's going to do the right thing. So that's number one. I'm going to touch on the first two. Let me hit the first two. No, there you go. Say, you guys. Real quick, just think about what your five are, because we all have different, I don't have five, I have like 50, right? Because I really want to be held to a high standard, and I want to hold you to a high standard. So that's what partners do. I call them out and BS, I have those uncomfortable conversations, because you need to have them, but you want to hold each other accountable, and that's what partnerships are all about. Holding yourself accountable to one another, and growing, and taking those lumps together. 
so the next one, the top two for me, obviously the moral compass, but the next one is work ethic. Look, MIH every day. If, if, I'm, if I'm up at six, I know he's gonna be up at six. If, if we're working at eight o'clock, if we're gonna be here till you know, midnight tonight, he's there by my side. Doesn't matter if he's in Florida and I'm in Tennessee, I can count on him. And at the end of the day, if you try to partner with somebody and they don't share that work ethic, how do you think that's gonna go down? It's, it's, it's gonna burn quick because you're gonna be carrying your weight and then that person's not gonna be doing what they're supposed to be doing, it's gonna piss you off. Those two, to me, are the most important. If you don't have a good moral compass and you're not willing to work your ass off, it's not gonna work out. I can go, uh, the third one, to me, it's all about growth, guys. It's learn, do, and then teach. Because we had 200 units, I remember. It was about uh, a year and a half after we bought our third deal. He became financially free, quit a job. He says to me, well, why don't we start a podcast? I'm like, I don't know how to teach people. I don't know anything. But it made me step out of my comfort zone. It made me learn the space. It made me learn how to relate to people. It made me learn how to actually underwrite deals better. It made me really work and learn my craft. And if you're not willing to grow in this economy, go to college for four years, six months after you're done, that stuff is all useless. It's whatever you've learned, gone, right? So you've got to continually grow. Feed your mind with positive stuff. You want to learn stuff. And that's what life's all about. Listen, I was talking to somebody a few minutes ago about, you know, Tony Robbins, the six, you know, fundamental needs. The fifth and sixth is growth and contribution. I wasn't growing at the restaurant. This is not growing, right? I wasn't contributing. That's ultimately, I think, what we all want. We want connections in life. It's not about making money. It's about connecting. Money's not the cause. Money is the result. Don't know why that works. It really sucks, right? Because you're working for money, working for money, and then when you become financially free, all of a sudden these opportunities come to you. That's how it is. But you want to work hard and you want to continue to grow. How many people in the room have a job right now? Wow, you guys are working. That's good. That's a good thing, right? How many people in the room are in real estate and have a job? Wow, we got some hustlers, Marma. We got the, we got the crew here. So let me ask you this. If you're out there working 40, 50 hours a week on your craft, on your job, and then you're out there, you're doing multifamily, you're doing duplexes, whatever you're doing, and you have a partner, and that partner is not responsive, when you maybe have a short window, okay, it's six to eight o'clock at night, and you need that person to respond to you, is that going to make you happy if you know that person isn't there for you? That is going to chap your ass quick, and you're going to want to get them out. So responsiveness responsiveness is key because everyone in this room if you're if you're working and you're investing in real estate this is a room full of hustlers right now everyone's out there trying to make it happen you cannot partner with somebody listen get with them the first few months test them out but if they're not being responsive walk away you don't want people like that in your life and i know there's some people right now that are having kind of conversations in their head because they're probably going through that right now and that's real But one thing, huh? Goals. Well, goals. But one thing I want to go back about the strongest thing about our partnership is this guy wants to write another book. I'm like, I don't want to write another book. That's not true. (laughs) You want to write the book, dude. No, but I I didn't want to write it. But the reason why I'm writing the second book is because of him. I committed to him. He sold me. Sell or be sold. He sold me hard this time. I wasn't ready to do it. But that's what partnerships are all about. It was tough to us pounding him for two weeks. Two weeks. You wouldn't let, you would let it go, but that's what it's all about. I would not have done it. I wouldn't be here right now because we like to push each other. We're, you know, we're draw a circle, three hours from Knoxville, Tennessee. We're starting to syndicate. We probably wouldn't have done that if I was by myself. It's too overwhelming. It's too daunting. But when I can lean on him and I can learn something from him and he can learn something from me, dude, it is powerful. Uh, so, so the last one here, there's going to be some overlaps, but think about goals. If, if he wants to solely get another job and fix and flip, and, and that's it, and I want to go invest in you know, two, 300 unit buildings, how's that going to work? That's, you, you have to have alignment with your goals. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with fixing and flipping. If you guys are fixing and flipping to create big you know, uh, liquidity uh, positions for yourself, great. Get that cash and run with it. But if, if you and your partner, if your partner wants to stay fixing and flipping and you're saying, look, I'm going to go into multifamily, I want to build wealth, I want to create generational wealth, what happens when you leave him as a fix and flipper, right? You know, you, you guys have to align your goals. And I know we're throwing a lot at you right now, but the reason that him and I have been able to do this to this point is because we got very clear in the beginning on what we were trying to achieve 
and we found somebody in, in, in each other that was responsive, that had a good moral compass, that did not care about doing whatever it takes to grind and make it happen. So I just I think it's very important for you guys to hear this because those areas are where you're going to fail and where you're going to crash and burn and why so many of you have heard in this room, partnerships don't work. I'm going to tell you something right now. Multifamily doesn't work if you try to do it by yourself. We started, maybe heard this in the podcast, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do everything. That was my mindset until I met Jim Clayton, the guy that sold his company Warren Buffett for a couple billion dollars. I told him that day, I said, look, if the rent check needs to go in, I'm running to the bank. If this needs to be done, I'm going to do that. Oh, we need to go to the AC store and pick that up, I'm going to do that. He's like, look, I respect you, I think you're a good kid, but you're going to hit a ceiling. That, and that ceiling is right above your head right now because you're going to burn out and you can't do it. You need to learn to put systems in place. You need to be able to hire the right people. I recommend this book to everybody. Big fan of Ray Dalio, Principles. The dude is a shaper. And the reason I love that book is because he's doing something very similar to myself where he's managing the investment side of the business, but he's also managing the business and firing, figuring out how to hire the right people. And that was my biggest takeaway from that book. So I recommend that one to everybody. Repeat it again, please. Principles, Ray Dalio. Beast. Going through it my third time right now, so not, anyways, but love it. it takes them three times to get it, right? <laughs> Listen, it's, it's pounded, I pounded. Look, this is, this is, I, I am the guy that figures that works. I don't, I don't, I'm not the educator like you. So let me talk about goals, 30 seconds. This is how you're going to hit your goals. First of all, write your goals down. They have to be in front of you all the time. I don't write goals down anymore because I just wake up every day. I'm excited to work. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I hate the weekend. Well, am I allowed to hear that? But I hate the weekend because everyone's shut down. I want to work. I want Monday morning to come around. And that's a great feeling. It might be weird to a lot of you guys, but it's true to me. I love it. Write your goals down. Commit to them. The next thing is partnerships are great. Join mastermind groups. You need to announce your goals to people. You need to be held accountable for those goals. Because if you don't hold yourself accountable or don't let hear people hear you, you're going to fall off the wagon. So hold yourself accountable. And to me, that was the most important thing. This is my first mastermind, me and him. We brought a third partner on. He's another mastermind right there. Josh, God love him, he's another mastermind. But he pushes me every morning. That's what it's all about. I joined the group called Go Abundance, a bunch of millionaire guys. These guys are so much smarter and so much better than me. I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. These guys are much smarter than me. I want to aspire to them. I want to reach up to them. And that's what was happening at the restaurant for me. That's what I forgot to you know, tell you guys. I was the smartest guy in the room. I wasn't growing. I felt like I was stuck there. My goal was to be around other guys. And you can all do that. Find mentors. Find people you can work with. Bring value to them. But surround yourself with smart people. We're going to get into that. Hold on a second. Sorry. It's just, this, is, this is the G Dead ping pong. I'm sorry. We're not going to try to kill you guys. But I'm going to say something now. I've been resistant to relationships in my life. I'm just going to get real with everybody. Um, you know, sitting in a room like this, I would have been the guy that, uh, yeah, you know, maybe not talking to the person next to me, or uh, maybe thinking I know everything, and, and just not opening up. I asked a few questions a little while ago, and everybody in this room is working. Everybody in this room is investing in real estate. I challenge everybody here to humble themselves. Look to the person next to you. Don't be so skeptical. Trust but verify, and you're going to find, if you don't have a partner right now and you need somebody, this is the room, guys. These Look, everybody in here is working. Everybody's in, into real estate. Talk to people, network. These are the times where you're gonna find that person. I'm lucky and fortunate because I knew his brother and we ended up connecting in the restaurant. That happened good for me because I wasn't at a point in my life where I was that accepting and was kind of forced into it because I knew his brother. So don't don't fall into that trap of, of like not willing to open yourselves up and humble yourself and saying, hey, Maybe this guy has something that I don't have, and if we partner together, there's going to be some magic that happens from that. So, challenge everyone to do that tonight. Well, I'll kick this one off. So, listen, partner responsibilities. When I started off, I was uh, working as a pharmaceutical rep. I was, you know, at the time I was selling something called Loveza, hustling the fish oil. Great times. Oh, we got a Loveza can in there. Get those tricks down. Oh, no, Get no. those tricks down. The pharmaceutical rep part. You're selling Loveza? No. I, I still take it. Oh, all right. All right. Very cool. Very cool. So here, here's the thing. Um, different partners have different responsibilities. Okay. So when you're when you want to get into multifamily, you want to get bigger part, apartment buildings. He had more net worth than I did. I was more of a boots in the ground, and that helped me 
because I didn't have the balance sheet that he had. Okay, I was willing to go out and hustle. He had a balance sheet and the knowledge. Okay, so those little things. Taught him everything he knows. He taught him everything he knows, man. Talk about it, man. Well, uh, this is great. I love this. You know that. Honestly, in the beginning, I did a lot of coaching. I did Dave Lindell's coaching. I did Rich Dad Poor Dad. Became a certified life coach. Like I said, I spent thousands of dollars because I needed it. Because like I said, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I wanted to be. I wanted to be smart. So I found the opportunity, right? It's a value for value proposition. Read The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. We had him on our podcast. The best freaking book once you become financially free because it makes so much sense. Because it's all about inbound marketing. It's about what you can do for somebody else. Because the more, the more people you can serve, the more people are going to come to you. So we were serving each other. I needed him because I couldn't invest in New York. And he needed me because he hated selling vaccines. So it was a great relationship. I helped him out. I taught him out on the right deals. I taught him how to manage. I taught him how to find the deal. He was down there. We started the management company. He managed the deal, boots on the ground. I remember the, how mom and pop we were. He'd send up all the paperwork up to me. I'd put everything into QuickBooks, send it back down to him. That's how we started. We just ground Rubber it out. Bands, yeah, yeah, that's right. And we had such a terrible bookkeeper, but that's another thing. And his quote is, <laughs> lean in. We leaned in, we figured it out because we had the big enough why. Because if there's a pothole there, I'm just going to go around the pothole because that why is really strong for me. So that's what was keeping me burning. It's all about the momentum. That 25 unit deal we bought in February of 2013, four months later, 36 unit. It's about momentum, it's about finding out what was going on. I was lucky enough that we found another partner with a stronger balance sheet. Like I said, it starts coming in and then the snowball started. A year later, 136 units. Multifamily experience. He was just talking about it. This is this is one of the areas that, from our story, we're a little different. Um, we're vertically integrated. We have a management company. We have we have like construction. We're getting into the brokerage business, education, syndication. We're we're going to talk about that stuff a little bit. But I didn't want to get into a business that I saw myself taking over and running long term if I didn't understand the nuts and bolts of it. So I know there's a lot of guys out there that can't self-manage okay one thing that I did early on was I said I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to be hiring the folks and I'm going to learn how to do this I jumped in I was working you know 40 hours a week as a farmer rep but I said I'm going to go and I'm going to start doing this management myself we had a 25 unit complex I would show up on Fridays I would do the leasing I would schedule appointments I would knock on doors I would do Saturday mornings and I would come back Monday afternoons so look it wasn't easy. I was doing a full-time job. I had a little burner cell phone. I was taking calls on the road, and it was like Cricket Wireless. I don't even know if you guys have heard of this. You know, you might you might keep a call for like 30 seconds before the thing dropped when you're going down the highway, but we figured it out. That wasn't the best way to do it, and, and we started to, you know, put systems in place. So I think Gino brought a lot to the table for us because he did do the education. I'm not here promoting education, but I think if you want to jump into something, you should figure it out. And I also think if you guys really want to take it to the next level, be the boots on the ground. Don't be afraid. It might not be for everybody, but I think the one of the reasons that we've been able to go so far and so fast is because we were boots on the ground and we figured it out. So, we go to the next one. The next one is deal flow. Now, I forgot to mention, I think all you're going to need is these four in the beginning when you first start out. Uh, I think T. Harbecker said it. Three, three things to the business, I think. Marketing, sales, and production processes. Don't confuse it. And multifamily is not that confusing. This third one is deal flow, finding the property. It's all about finding the property. You need net worth, liquidity, multifamily experience, and finding the property. We we'll go to the next one. I want to touch on number three real quick. I don't want to go too long, but uh... what I value more than anything right now is the deal. The market's very hot. Everyone's aware of that. And it's great to go work with a broker and, and see what he has and you know get a five cap and, and, and start to do it. You can make money doing that. But I think right now, the true value in everything is the deal flow. So we've started to ramp that up. Dylan's heading that up for our team. We have some other folks in the room that are actually working with us to crank this up to the next level because that's where the money is. At the center of the wheel, we're gonna talk about the spoke later and all the different businesses that come off of owning multifamily. It all comes down to the holding company. It all comes down to the cash flow that's gonna be generated off that, that actual business. When you buy an apartment building, you are buying a business. The guys that don't get it are the guys that we buy from because they think they should be in real estate and it's a good place to be. Don't be that guy. Treat it like a business because it is. And, and really quick, the fourth one is raising, raising equity. 
you run to raise capital. Because once you start scaling up, we haven't syndicated yet. We've been fortunate to refinance and roll over $8 million in our proceeds. We just got a, we got lucky. I mean, it's all about our cat. Remember Richest Man in Babylon? Everyone thought he was lucky. He was just prepared. We were lucky. We caught the market at the right time, but we were prepared. Now, you guys got to get prepared because there's going to be another correction. If you don't start preparing now and start raising equity, start making substantive relationships, you're going to lose it because when the market does crash 18 months from now or two years from now, you're going to say, you know what? I'm not ready. So start getting prepared now and raising equity. I saw Dave Van Horn in the room. He's all about raising capital, right? And I mean, podcasts, I mean, we started the education just for fun, but wow. 300 investors later on our, on our thing, we started. So now that we're syndicating, we're not scrambling around looking for money. We've actually got the money, we found the deal, put two and two together, and you got it. I wanna challenge you guys to think right now because we can sit here and talk and that's great, but if we're not learning, we're not growing right now, I think I think we're being stagnant. So if you could go back just for a second because I gotta I got keep my, uh, my stuff straight here. Anyone in the room interested in multifamily? You, you, you're you're a bold man sitting in the front row. So tell us, out of these here, where you see yourself fitting in, and if you're going to do a partnership, how you see yourself playing out. Dang. I've got, as, as of right now, I've got maybe number three. I don't have the net worth of liquidity, experience, or equity, so I would have to, I guess, be the boots on the ground, learn how to find the deals, and like learn how to, I guess, manage them, stuff like that. Anyone else in the room maybe a potential equity partner or in a position that's interested in multifamily. Just raise your hand so maybe you can identify each other later on or are we all just deal finders? One, two, anyone else? Three, four, five. Okay, this is the kind of stuff, six. This is the stuff, seven. Okay, now they're coming up. Now we're getting bold. <laughs> Guys, don't be shy. This is a family affair here. It's Jake and Gino. We don't gotta get too like uh, uptight. This is what I'm talking about. You're gonna get the most value from this event by saying, look at this. I don't, I don't know, this is, this is something very creative. Jake Senziano, guest speaker, uh, investor, agent, wholesaler. Guys, look at this stuff because th these events are about you growing your network and getting deals done. Don't come here and, and paralysis by analysis and look at a million deals. Get something done. Get something out of this event tonight. Make it worth your while. Okay? I just think it's important. You can throw the rest of the slides up all together. I think I want to see them all. I want to show them all. So these are the responsibilities. I can read them off to you real quick, but I think this is what you've got to get clear on. Who is underwriting the deal? First thing, underwriting deals. Maybe you, which on the ground, maybe he can underwrite deals too. A lot of value in underwriting deals. Who's raising or contributing capital? Who's running day-to-day -day operations? He's day-to-day -day operations of the property management, um, day-to-day -day operations of the education. Let's be clear on that. We overlap. I don't want to kill him with 30 emails on what's going on in the education side. He doesn't know about the CRM. And I don't know about what he's talking about with the regional manager all the time. We have clear and defined roles. Who's team building? Now, team building is great because we have the podcast. And the best thing about the podcast, we're not really monetizing it, but all the people we talk to and all the people we can put on our team, we're doing a live event in October, the 6th and 7th in Nashville. Half of the speakers there are from our podcast. I mean, we've learned so many things from that podcast. I mean, if you want to touch on that, I think that's really important. I Let do me... want to touch on it. Because it's going to be awesome. <laughs> all right? That's the one thing. <laughs> Oh, I just I'm, I'm excited about the event because we're gonna we're, we're gonna get into it. But uh, you know, no team build. We got we got in also to team build a little bit here. I think that a a tip for anybody out there, and and I, I've been kind of going off on a rant about this, is that one of the areas that we've identified is kind of our blue ocean strategy, if you will. We're in the C and B class multifamily space, and typically. The, the folks that we're buying, the complexes that we're buying from, we're buying from mom and pop owners, they have been underserved. And the, the one thing that we've done really well is we've identified managers for these properties that understand customer service. And I'm gonna give a shout out to Ruth, uh, Ruth Chris right now. The one place that we found our rock star managers is from Ruth Chris. A little partial to Del Frisco's, but we don't have one in Tennessee. So like maybe we can find some good ones there. But the one thing that you do get from pulling in people from Ruth's is they learn customer service. And I think the one thing that, that you need to do, if you're gonna get in the, the CMB apartment space, is separate yourself. Don't be like everybody else and, oh, I'm gonna go in and, and not put any money to the unit and turn it. You want to provide a high level of customer service to separate yourself to justify the rents that you're paying because this is a business, okay? And if you can offer that level of customer service, you're gonna separate yourself from the other jerk-offs out there that are just trying to be slumlords. And I think that is key 
to operate in the CMB space. So the fifth and the sixth is who's handling business development systems. We didn't have systems in the beginning. We were flying by the seat of our pants. We were doing QuickBooks. From QuickBooks, we went to RentPost. When we finally got to Appfolio at 700 units, we are cheap. When you hit 100 units, go to property management software. Don't worry about the $2 a unit or whatever professional up. And as we've been building, we've been implementing our systems in our business. And who's going to be putting it together and closing the deal? That's what he's doing right now. That's his responsibility. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You can put them down. Sorry. So, we, we, look, we don't mean to belabor the point, but this is time commitments. This is going back to understanding your partner, okay? Are they willing to work weekends? Are they going to hustle? How many hours per week? Discuss family commitments. We keep busting this guy's chops. We keep trying to get him on these weekend events. He's like, look, the G Dad's a family man, and that's okay because we got to be respectful of that, right? We didn't get into the business just to grind our faces off nine, you know, like all the time. You got to, you know, get in the business because maybe a greater purpose. Didn't want to work Christmas, didn't want to do these things. So you can enjoy the weekends too because you have to, re re like, basically respect the time freedom that you get and not just say it's 24 7 every day of the week. Even though that's what the, we got the Jay Bird and the dog back there doing. The younger guys, we'll, we'll, we'll let them carry that torch. What are their business commitments, right? Because a lot of people in this room, what do we see? Same thing, working 40 hours a week, working 50 hours a week, still in real estate. Like, be realistic, but also be timely with your responses. Don't let your partner hang there wondering what's going to happen, what are we doing next, because that's not going to be a good partnership, right? You can go to the next one. But yeah. as far as business commitments, when I started out, I was working 55 hours a week, so I homeschool my kids too. So I'd get up in the morning, nine o'clock. Um, I get up by eight o'clock, which homeschool for about 45 minutes. Go to work. Go to work till like two o'clock at lunchtime. Lunchtime, I'd sit down and do a Jake and Gino blog. Dinner time comes. The dinner rush. Nine o'clock comes home. I go home and do another blog. So I would put that commitment. That's what you need to do. You need to be real with yourself, and you need to communicate with him that this is what I'm doing. And as far as going away on the weekends and stuff. It's tough for me, and I told these guys, and it's really hard, and they're pushing me, and they're pushing me, and I can't be sold on that, because it's just something that's really important for me, and you have to tell your, your partners, you know, I can do the commitments, and you know, the, you know, we're going to a live event that weekend, I'm bringing my whole family. So you see all my kids in the back selling swag, selling shirt, because it's a family affair, and I hope they make some big sales, because uh, I can't say no to kids, but you know, that, that's what it's all about, you know? And, and that's what real estate should be about. It's about a business, bring the family in. I had, that's the only thing I miss about the restaurant, is not having my family there. Real estate, it will allow me. bro. Well, not well, no, but I mean, with the with the with the restaurant, it's it, that's the only thing I miss from the restaurant is not having the family. Now with the real estate, I can start doing that with the JKG. I can start doing that, so that's important. So let's back it up one more. I, I think the I just want to make one key takeaway here. If you're getting into business. We're probably all doing LLCs. You may not. Maybe you're doing a management company, an S corp, whatever. Great. Put it in writing. Put the expectations in place. If you need a buy sell agreement, you know, put that in place. But the, the key is, if you're going to have an LLC, have an operating agreement because things happen, right? Even if you want to, like, someone may die. What happens then, right? That's what the buy sell agreement is for. So just, I, I call it professional up. Don't leave yourself exposed, okay, because that's the key to this. And you want to put expectations in an operating agreement, probably not the place to go cheap, right? You know, we always try to bootstrap and hustle in the beginning. Put the LLC in place, put the operating agreement. And I always stress, each time you buy a property, if it's going to be, you know, multifamily place, put a separate LLC so you're not cross-contaminating these things, right? Next you want to hit the L series LLC? Just talk them real quick. Yeah, I'll talk that. about the series LLC because it's something that guys are talking about now, and we've looked at it. We struggle with it. Yeah, and they're like, oh, well, there's there's you know, a case study that hasn't been challenged, this, that, and the other thing, right? There's 20 years, and there's yeah. no case law on it. That's the thing that I struggle with. So there's no case law saying that anyone's ever pierced it or done it. We have too many LLCs right now. We've got maybe 15. So for us to restructure, it's going to cost us a lot of money. But if you start on the front end and you start growing with the series LLC, I think that might be the, the one thing I'll say to that is... Yes, we pay more because each one of our uh, our, our buildings or our actual like apartment complexes are held in a different LLC. I sleep better at night knowing that because if someone does find a way to pierce the series LLC, you know, structure or whatever, everything's not going down. We're not we're not contaminating these other businesses. So 
I sleep better at night knowing I have a big umbrella in place. I have separate LLCs, and, and I'm set up pretty well. Um, our buddy, I think it was Scott the other day, is talking about putting these things in land trust you know, to further protect yourself. That's a conversation for another day. But the idea is you work your ass off to find these deals. You, you don't want some you know, BS slip and fall costing your investment, right? So that's, that's the idea of protecting. Just do your due diligence and you know, look at Scott Smith. He did, we did a podcast with him. Do your due diligence, look at it, see if it works for you. It hasn't worked for us yet. We're still not sold on it, but I think it's something you guys should all look at. Let's talk about a series LLC. Though. Yeah. yeah. So I want to get this real quick. Sure. Um, we do want to uh, bring Dylan Marmot up at this point to talk about syndication because he does head up that division of Rand Partners, which is our uh, syndication business. And Dylan, if you want to come over here yeah, so, yeah. so we can see and, and take it away. Awesome. Well, I joined the team uh, a couple months back here. Super grateful to be a uh, part of the group here. I had learned syndication model through a gentleman that has a couple hundred million dollars in syndication. And, and just like these guys said, they, they're managing so many businesses right now. I was grateful you know, to be brought onto the team to lead up the uh, the syndication and play the role of both you know, acquisitions as well as investor relations. So I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about syndication as a whole. I know a lot of times folks have questions on that. When is the right time to syndicate? What does the syndication model look like? What are the advantages of being a GP? What are the advantages of being an LP? What does that really mean? So we're going to just take a couple minutes to cover that. So we're going to go to the next slide. All right, so the LPGP structure. So when you're syndicating what you're doing, syndication is the art of pooling together investors' money to buy an asset that an investor may not be able to purchase on their own. Really what you're doing is you're creating a security. So you're creating a vehicle for an investor to passively invest and receive the advantages, the tax advantages, as well as the cash flow and the equity upside investing in a larger asset. So when you look at the... Uh, the LPGP structure, this is just the way it's, it's all formatted. So a limited partner is a business partner whose liability is limited to the amount of their investment in the company. So they are not on a loan. They are not going to be responsible for all of the leveraged capital, which could be 70%, 80%, right? The, those that are on the general partnership, right? You have limited in the general partnership. Those that are on the general partnership are signing all the loan docs. So the most that they risk is just their initial capital that's invested. Um, again, they're not a material uh, participant in the business operations, and the IRS considers their income passive income. Uh, the general partner is an owner of a partnership who has unlimited liability and active in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So the general partner is the one that's making all the final game time decisions. They're the one that's out there ma managing the business, and they're also the one that's signing on the loan, so they're taking on a bigger risk. Now, how does that work, right? Why would they do that? And of course, there's something in it for the general partner, right? The way that a syndication model typically works is that you have some sort of a split. So, so well, the limited partners, which could be some of the general partner's capital, as well as outside investor's capital, right? the limited partner is the one that's buying the, uh, the deal itself. They have an LLC where all the capital goes in and they buy the deal itself. The general partner does all the legwork, they put in all the sweat equity to go out there and work hard and take on the risk. And then typically the way it works is that you give the limited partners a majority share of the equity upside, and then the general partner receives a minority share of the equity upside. So it can be it could be in some instances it's a 60-40 split, 70-30 split, 80-20 split, whatever it might be, the general partner is in a position where they're going out there to put all the hard work in to receive a portion of the, the upside, and that could be the cash flow, and that could also be the forced appreciation, because remember, our whole goal here is to step in and to begin to, over time, raise the rents and improve the value of the overall property, so you create equity within the property. Right. This is an important slide here, because I want you guys to take a look at this. Well, the first thing is, I just want to give him a shout out, because I don't know if you know how old he is, he's 25 years old. He figured out his why, right? He flew out from San Diego. He spent thousands of dollars for one hour with Grant Cardone. He got clear. So the reason why I'm telling you this, he focused. He knows what he wants. He doesn't know what he doesn't want. When I was at the restaurant, I knew what I didn't want. I didn't know what I wanted at the time. So focus. So he's a big role model to me. I've really never told him this, but I'm really impressed with him. He gives me faith in millennials, seriously. He's only, he's only 25 years old. I mean, you would know it, right? I mean, my mom is like, oh, yeah, really? I'm like, because, like I said, living belief, all millennials, you know, they live in the parents' basement or whatever. I mean, he is MIH. He's out there, like we said. 
you're going to find the deals? Well, he flew out, worked with a guy, learned the skill set, but he brought value. He's a great sales guy. He taught the guy how to sell product in return for working with him. So value for value. Now, he's here with us, and he's doing the same thing with us. So seriously, Today, 25 hey, you years fired old. Me up here. You fired me up here. <laughs> this millennial stuff is bullshit, OK? People are people, and you're going to find folks wherever you go that hustle, all right? and. Uh, we got Jay Stenz. We got another Stenziano back there. So I don't know if you folks know this, but that, we got the real deal back there. So, but seriously, listen, the, the, these media articles are trying to get you fired up, right? And, and Uncle Sean's pushed me back in front of the, the thing here. But seriously, guys, if you're going to partner with somebody, don't take these stupid stereotype bullshit in, in place here because we, we got the Jay Bird back there who's 24 7. We got Dylan here. And even with the property management, the, the folks that are driving our property management business are millennials, okay? And, and these are folks that have they have serious work ethic and they have serious values. So all this crap that the, these these like media personalities are putting out, it's a punt, okay? Because it's going to prevent you from partnering with the right people that are they're going to help you grow your business. And it just it's it's just like a thing that's burning here that's firing me up because this guy moved to Knoxville, okay? People are like, dude, to me, what the hell did you move to Knoxville for, okay? And and you know I have a lot of like reasons why I did it and it, and it changed my life. But, you know, you, you take a 24-year-old guy and it's like, you know, he, he should be here in the city doing his thing. And he is. And he's doing it right now. But he's setting himself up for life and, and he's going to grow wealth by doing that. So I think that's, that falls into his why there. So I don't know where I'm going with this, but you just, the g is get me fired up here and the millennial stuff is bullshit. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I didn't mean to go off on the Only going millennials here again. Well, here we go. No, it's, it's a good topic just because you guys are talking about partnerships. And, and my whole belief is that you either seek to serve or pay to play. Right, and I mean that as in you're either paying for your education, you're investing in your education, or you're seeking to serve. You're thinking, what problem do these people have that I can go in there and solve, and, and finding a way to add value. And that's how I've, I've gained some of the greatest mentors that I've had to to help me learn a lot of these uh, these skill sets as is. So back on track here. Why do why do the uh, general partners get paid? So uh, you know, of course, I think one of the limiting beliefs that we're going to have as a general partner is that in the beginning we think, wow, 70, 30 split. Well, that sounds like a whole lot, right? But if you look at the actual work that goes into this, there, there's a lot of work up front that's going to that's gonna take place before you're going to get your investors these kind of returns, right? We're not just sitting back on our computers. No offense to anyone that's you know, in, in the stock market, right? But it, but it's a lot more... We can hate a stock market here. It's okay. We can, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna, <laughs> but we're not, just, you know, we're not just pressing buttons and, and uh, you know, seeing what, what's going on there. We're, we're actually actively on the properties day to day. We have the management company in house and we're putting a lot of, a lot of hard work up front to get these kind of returns. And we're, we're placing a lot of emphasis on the control that we have in all of our assets, especially if you have the, uh, the management in house. So, Let's think about what, what do the general partners do? Now, just up front, you, you have to go out there and find the deal, right? And the whole thing right now, especially in the market we're in, it's look at 100 deals to find the one good deal. That takes a lot of effort, right? So that's why you have, oftentimes you have an acquisition fee up front because there's a lot of hard work up front. So you're sourcing, you're identifying the assets. Then you're going through, you're underwriting all the deals, right? So you might look at 100 deals, you might underwrite you know, 40 of them, who knows? Uh, then you're gonna negotiate and close the deal itself. Uh, develop a business plan for the property, negotiate the contract, conduct thorough due diligence, uh, secure the financing, uh, which again, we're putting our names on the uh, on the loan itself. You have, a, you have to have the, usually the rule of thumb is to have the net worth equivalent to the loan amount, right? So you're, you're on there. Uh, then you have to close the deals, then you have to manage the property, then you have to execute the business plan and deliver returns, take care of all the accounting mm -hmm. side of things, and then dispose of the assets and deal with the, uh, the sale or the, the refi. Now, if you guys don't get all this, I have a slide deck, Gino at jakeandgino.com. I will share the slide deck with you. Um, also, one thing, I, I, I met him on LinkedIn. So anybody want to hook up with me on LinkedIn, Gino Barber, I'd love to meet you guys on LinkedIn. From him, went to Josh. Guys were like-minded, like to hang out together, and that's how I met these two guys, so. Uh, what is a hurdle rate? So a hurdle rate is a term that gets thrown around a lot when it comes to uh, the distribution. So distributions can be done in a, a number of ways. There's a couple different definitions that you want to you want to be familiar with. The, uh, well, First, you're going to have the split. Then you're going to have you might have an acquisition fee. Some companies also use asset management fees, which can be a couple percent. So you want to be familiar with the different types of, of miles you'll see. Uh, one thing that you know we get asked a lot from our investors that aren't uh, used to investing in these type of assets is what is a preferred return. So before I get into this, a preferred return 
is giving you a priority of the way that the distributions are paid out. So if you are an investor and you hear an eight preferred return, that means the first 8% of cash flows that are paid out that year will be going back into your pocket before any kind of splits or any anything else takes place. So it gives you a priority return. It usually gives a lot of peace of mind as an investor to hear a preferred return. And that does not mean that's your entire return for the year or for the entire investment. It just means that before anyone else gets paid, before any of the, these other uh, you know splits kick in, you are getting paid X amount. So that's be, first to uh, be familiar with. Then, uh, then you have the hurdle rate. The, uh, the hurdle rate could be uh, an instance where you have a preferred return and then after that preferred return, the, uh, the actual uh, split itself kicks in. Or it could mean even after that, there could be something where after 15 IRR, you know, after you hit a certain return or a certain cash flow, depending on how everything's laid out for you, um, then it could change the split. You could do a 50-50 split after 15 or 20 percent. So there's all different ways you can structure that. So when you hurdle a uh, hurdle rate, it really just means after X amount of return, the way it's laid out for you, then this is what 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 takes place. Uh, you can go to the next one too. It's the same thing. Yeah. So how to how to decide uh, upon your equity splits? Uh, there's a number of factors that uh, that really play into this. Now, one thing that's First to make note of is that a lot of people get caught up in thinking that the investment is, is as good as the equity split is. So I'm going to go and invest with the guy that does a 90-10 split because he has a 90-10 split. So he's taking a whole lot less of the deal, right? But what if he's buying deals at a 6% cash on cash? There's, not, there's no upside to the deal, right? Is a 90-10 split really the best investment for you? No, right? I've seen guys that do a 60-40 split in these, these high splits that they've gotten their investors. 30%, 50%, right? They've gotten some extremely high returns that anyone's going to be happy with. So first thing is to, to be familiar with that. It's not just about the split. It's about what's left over at the end of the deal. What's my return on investment going to be? So one thing that does factor in on how you're going to decide upon the splits is what kind of deals are you going to be bringing in, right? Are you going to get the off-market deals? Are you going to put a lot of time and effort up front to find the, the, the winners, right? Um, also, what kind of market? I just, I just got to touch on this. Do you, uh, bottom line is, are you going to work with someone that values their time and their performance to blow it out, or you want the 90-10 guy? And like for you guys that aren't really into this, it, it's very specific because there's guys out there that are trying to churn these things through, and it's it's more of a uh, process. But when you're really getting into it, you want to be with a guy that that's fine that this is there, but there's so much more upside on it because they've taken the time to really identify the asset that's going to blow it out that that's what you want to get into, not get lost in the weeds on this. So let's relate this to you guys. When you're first starting out with your syndication, I don't know if you're going to start a 70-30 split. We're going to start because we've got the credibility, we've got the guys, but uh, but you know what? 10% of 100 bucks is better than 0% or whatever. You know you know what I'm talking about. So maybe you start with 90-10 on your first deal. Um, the other thing is when you syndicate, it's all about the sponsor. If you don't like the sponsor, don't do the deal because a great deal and a sucky sponsor, when that deal blows up, that sponsor's gonzo. But a great sponsor and a marginal deal, I'll do that every day because they'll back their words. So those what's are two the, what's things. What's the one always ask you to repeat? The guy with the money met the... Uh, a person with money <laughs> meets a person with experience. That was me. The person with the experience gets the money, and the person with the money gets the experience. And that's how it is. I went through it a couple times. <laughs> really painful for me. But um, the other thing I was wanted to talk about... Uh, on our third deal, this is really important. He didn't have enough capital, so what did we do? He charged the company an acquisition fee. Charges two percent, I think it was like sixty or seventy grand. He used that money, rolled it in equity into the deal. We got it like another ten percent down. Fantastic strategy for you guys to do. What about me hitting up Grandma Grandpa for ten grand too? <laughs> did you ever pay him back? Yeah. No interest. So well, I wanted to give them interest. They would take it. I said, Grandpa, this is an opportunity. He said, No, it's okay. You're right. <laughs> so it's important. That's how you can do it. You find a deal. You ask him for ten percent equity when you bring the deal. It's all about the value. But that's really important. Um, that's one way you can structure it. So, I think that's about it. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. I, I, I really want to get into this next one, but I, I want to see like how you guys are feeling. Do we want to get into some Q&A, or do you want to talk about the wheel? And this is about you guys. We're here for you guys. Jake and Gino give till, you know, till it hurts, right? That's a, that's a Rock of Ages quote. But anyways, so guys, we can go home now. We can answer questions, and we can keep this, this party rolling. It's, it's up to you. I want to hit this presentation. No, I, he said no. Gino's owning this right now. He said we're going to push on, and we're going multifaceted right now. So we're hitting the wheel. GDAD rules. Let's go. Next slide, please. This is what it's all about for me. This is what gets me excited. This is what gets me out of bed in the morning. 
I love creating businesses because we've learned to scale, okay? This is not the holding company. We're gonna edit this because this represents the holding companies. Gino mentioned we got 15 holding companies, right? The holding companies are in the middle of the wheel. The thing we learned quickly about multifamily, people talk about multiple streams of income all the time. That's the cool thing, that's the buzzword. Get into multiple streams of income, get passive income. What the hell does that mean, right? It's something and it's real. This is where we were able to find it. What this wheel represents is the different companies that have come to us through multifamily investing. You see at the top here, Rand Property Management. That's the first thing that came out of multifamily investing for us. We wanted to learn exactly what goes into this. Didn't know how far it was gonna go, but we started a property management company. We're you know, over 25 employees now, closing on 30 on the next deal. And that's my passion, right? I love these folks. That's you know what I do on the day to day besides you know the stuff that I work with in Gino, but that's that's what really first stemmed off of it. Okay, you see this. Wrote a book with this guy. Started a podcast. Started an education company. The book's great, by the way. I don't know if we're supposed to be plugging, but it's awesome. All right. Jake and Gino started an events company. Started doing the podcast. You know these other things. So we have a marketing arm now that gets out there. Dylan was just up here. Asset management, doing syndications now, okay? This was painful. This one right here, for a guy that barely graduated high school, had to sit through a broker's class over a three week period, you might as well blow my head off, right? I was, I was sitting here. All he did was complain for three weeks. And I'm not a bitch, like I usually don't whine about it, right? <laughs> But uh, you know, not, not a book guy, I like to really get out there and learn by doing. So, look, we got through it. Yes, I did pass, we're okay, we're in the clear, <laughs> no worries there. But uh, the bottom line is, you know, what, what's happening with the brokers though, is this is more than anything to us, is deals, deal flow is, is, is the name of the game right now. Getting the deal flow, getting the deals in house. Look, if it doesn't work, we can sell it and, and put that money back into marketing. That's not necessarily a profit center, like some of the rest of these businesses, but it's amazing, and these are just the, these are the big ones, guys. We're gonna get in some more in a minute here, but getting into multifamily, it is a business, and multiple businesses can stem off from this, and that's that's what I'm passionate about, and that's why I love it. Like I said, I wasn't smart enough to come up with this by myself. It was in a mastermind group yep. over a weekend, a guy who owned a vacation rental company down in Florida, which I'm building a couple of vacation rentals with him because the opportunity's there. He goes like this, gives me the wheel. He goes, I have a vacation rental company. I'm a custom builder, property managing it, selling them. I'm like, wow, multiple streams of income. That makes so much sense. You can relate it to any business. I'm gonna show you slides about my restaurant. I did some cool stuff at the restaurant. If you're a residential broker, you got your license. Why about title company? Why not have an education? Why not fix and flip houses? Why not do private money? Any business is relatable, but we don't think of that. I was talking to Andre before, a little affiliate marketing, a little digital media. You can start building multiple streams of income if you get rid of your limiting beliefs. My limiting belief was multifamily, was landlord. I had to be there all the time. I saw it at the fourplex in New York, almost burned me out. Once I started implementing this, and multifamily allows you to scale. 100 units, you can have a leasing agent. You can have two maintenance guys. You can't do that with single family homes. I really can't stress this enough though. I think what that stuff you just talked about has brought to our business, let me go one back. It just, it, it, it literally, you know, when you're getting 20 checks a month, they don't all have to be for 10 grand, okay? Because it starts to stack, right? And that's what the multifaceted multifamily has done. And, and it's a, no, go ahead, go ahead. One, one, of, one, other thing, one other thing that I really forgot to mention, which is really more powerful than anything else, you want an education? Come educate with me. You don't want an education? I've got deals. They feed off each other so beautifully. Um, like I said, people listen to the podcast. We had 300 people on our investor list without even me trying. So let's start the syndication. Within three months, we called every single one of those guys. We've got 100 guys who would pledge money to us. That would not would have happened without the education. And the education fuels the syndication. The brokerage is going to fuel the syndication. So they work so symbiotically and so well. And I think one of the most important things is choose what you like. 
I like podcasts. I like to educate. I like to write. I like to create content. I like to talk to people. I like to life coach. Education, I gravitate towards it, and that's what's really awesome about it. Jake got stuck. He likes a property manager. That's what he was doing. Stuck, man. Well, but you, that, that, that was the first one. So I did not get stuck. I'm super passionate about it. And the other thing is, you look at that. We are laying literally the foundation right now, and this is just the beginning for us because maybe we do a title company someday. Like that's not that big of a deal because we just want to literally control everything. But we're literally laying the foundation now, and now we're just stacking bricks, just adding to it because everything feeds each other. Everything's serving the other businesses, and to his point, maybe maybe you come into you know our universe and you like this, and, and we can serve you, or maybe there's another another piece to it. But it's all serving each other. It's a big circle of life, and, and now it's just stacking bricks up. And now that the foundation is laid, just going up from there. It's a beautiful thing, really. You can you can list them all. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Hey, do you want to go ahead? You can go back one. Just go back one. Yeah, right there. I mean, take a look at all these multiple streams of income. We've got investment. We said property management, education, brokerage, syndication, service company. Any HVAC guys out there? Any plumbers? Any roofers? We need that. We have 900 units. Somebody wants to come partner with us. Could you imagine if we got somebody that could take care of all of our driveways or all of our roofs? Do you think we want to partner with them and give them maybe 10% and they take care of it? And oh, by the way, they have their own little business on the side. We'll get 50% of your business. I think that'd be really good. That's a great way to get into multifamily. Construction company, we've got a little CapEx crew going on. Trash Valley, can you believe that tenants will actually pay 15 bucks a month to leave their garbage outside their apartment? That's cheap. That's yeah. cheap. Can you imagine that? I never knew that, but in the B&A space, that's what they do. 900 units times $10, $20 a month, that's it was 18 grand a month. That is some really crazy money to, to do that, right? So you start a little business where you got one maintenance guy, let him do all your sin, you're paying him 35 grand a year. You start a little business, get a truck for him, you start your Trash Valley. Software company consulting. We've got a little online platform where we're actually consulting. I do a little life coaching. We've got a little platform there. Product sourcing. This one is a struggle for us because we're trying to source products from China. I know we got a couple of guys that we speak out there, but why not source products from China? Why not container loads of, of uh, flooring? If you have too much, start selling to other people. Start a little business. Vending. Not such a great thing on vending, but if you got a guy who's got vending machines, let him drop them off in your place and split the revenue with him. Moving company. Get a truck out in front of your place, split the revenue with the guy, because you got guys moving in and out of your units, great thing. And I was just talking to somebody before about VRBOs, little short-term rentals. Yeah, go back one. This, number six, that is the all time. I want to own either a parking lot or a parking garage someday because you want to talk about systematizing and, and letting like a, a little arm at the front gate do the work. That that is that is Nirvana for me. You know, if you want to know how my my, my mind works. Okay, so that that's I hope that happens. We'll see where it goes. Anyone in the in the room in parking? Let's let's get up and uh, and see what we can do after. I love networking at these events. Okay. But we've hit on you know we we got a deal right now with a a large you know. Uh, a company that actually places cell phone towers where you know they, they feel they're going to be needed. A lot of the old contracts are either expiring or they're they're either very costly. So if they can move that cell tower to a new spot, they're going to do that because the old contracts were very expensive and they're trying to cut costs. Learn a little bit. Of, I mean, shit. I didn't get into multifamily thinking about cell towers, but that's a revenue source, right? So why not take it? Um, laundry. A business within a business. Again, this is not on the wheel, but we make a lot of money. You know, probably over hundred thousand dollars a year on laundry. You know, I, we are in the laundry business, whether we like it or not. Okay, it's real. They will pay you to yeah. take the machines out. They'll give you new machines, and as cheap as we are, we go on Craigslist and we sell the old machines on top of that. So um, we don't want to be in the business of cleaning machines. Our maintenance guys are there to serve customers, not serve lint. We're not there collecting coins because we want to grow a business. The limiting belief was I had to collect those coins. No. Here's here's the thing too. We're looking at a deal right now, and you start to spot these things. We're cutting the lawn ourselves, and 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 like I love talking about mom and pops. And for you guys that have listened to the show, we talk about mom and pops all the time. Deal we're looking at right now. They're cutting the lawn. Guess whose most exciting thing every month is the owner right now with the bag of coins gets to go around the laundry machine, the laundry machine, the laundry machine. They're not treating it like a business, okay? Their their big you know thing every month is they get to go. Get a couple thousand bucks and process this, okay? Right now, if one of our maintenance guys sees one of our laundry machines are down, they don't care. 
Yeah. No, no, they don't call. It's on the app. They scan a picture of it, goes to the company, they send a tech out, they fix it, tenant's taken care of, company's coming to pick up the quarters. This is systematizing, this is creating a business. We're not, you know, we're not going around right now trying to handle these laundry machines. Yes, we do like more control. We do, we do keep a very tight leash on these guys, but that's one area that we do, you know, partner with folks on. Storage. Oh, a cable car. Don't forget, don't forget a cable contract. That's a big one. Yeah, we actually, we, what was it? 2016 in, in the spring, we were acquiring a deal, and that company actually had a cable contract in place. Guess who was fortunate to get a fifty thousand dollar check at closing? because they had the cable contract going in and it literally closed the month before, so we get a pro rata share of that. Cable's huge. We make a lot of money on cable every year. Um, it's just it's just another one of these things. Storage uh, storage is the funny one because a lot of these uh, a lot of these apartment complexes may have a small storage component. And the, the reason we like this is because folks want the apartment home, okay? Apartment home, what does that look like? They want the washer dryer hookups. They want maybe some storage there. And so you get into it, maybe storage is extra 1500 bucks a month. It adds up, you know, when you start to scale your portfolio. Um, but, you know, hit the, hit the last few things. Well, what I wanted to say about it is, as you can see, these are all amenities. Yeah. These are all, well, other than the cell tower, but these are all, you're adding value. Storage is great because they're going to keep their crap in your place for a lot longer, and they're not going to move for the $10 increase, but it's also a value for value. Parking is another one. I know down in Florida, you got covered parking, you got carports. There's limited parking. You can make, I mean, I have the fourplex up in New York. We charge 50 bucks for a spot. It's an extra $200 a month for guys park their car. Multiply that by 30 or 40. You can make a ton of money doing that. And like I said, the, the one for me is the van rental. I want to get van rentals. I'm struggling with him. He doesn't want to get them. I'm dying to do that. So. The first I heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to show you, just share you real quick about my restaurant business. It's the same thing. And I had not done this. My brother didn't know his why. I was stuck in the kitchen. I couldn't do it. I was trying to build a business. I knew my why. I wanted to work with my family. But look at it. Got the restaurant business. We started doing a very successful catering business with him, cranking it out. My brother's doing barbecues in the summertime now. Told him to get a food truck, a pizza truck. Those are four revenue sources from one little crappy seven unit place, right? Let's continue. I started a physical products business. Um, you can go to the next slide. I just want to show them the. Uh... I do have a Gino's knife and it's awesome. Right? So, it's really cool. I wrote a cookbook. I mean, yeah. really hard writing a cookbook, but I wrote a cookbook. Ebooks. Got tons of videos. You go online, watch me online. I was building a brand. I had it. It didn't work. Thankfully, it didn't work because I got down with this guy. I got down to Florida. But as you can see, any business out there has its multiple streams of income, and that's what you want to do. And this is replicatable. And the great thing about it is, once you sell your book, as you guys are all out there, it's done. You can sell it. Um, he did cooking classes at people's houses. How much fun that is! That's a lot of fun. You got 20 people in a house. You're getting two or three grand for the night. You're cooking for them. This is me right here. This is the kitchen. That's how I used to stand. I used to sit. You see, my brother's always talking. He's always the talker. I'm the doer. I'm always cooking. This was the energy guy. And then we hit so, but we were doing we were doing cooking classes on Monday nights. I remember we were closed. We were charging 150 bucks. It wasn't it wasn't the money. It was a lot of fun. You network. You build the business. So, as you can see, it's across any spectrum, across any business. Yeah, yeah. So, so this one, this one's really uh, near and dear to my heart because there's something out there we're not going to get into it tonight called cost segregation, and it literally uh, allowed me to retire a year early. And how do I say this? It is. Some people won't say, well, that's not another stream of income, but when you're doing cost segregation and you're literally wiping out all of your taxes every year because you're a real estate professional and you can get that real estate professional designation, that changes your life. And that changes your life quick. You've got the CPA here, so talk to him about it. It's important. Talk to the CPA, right? I just, like, we hire good folks. Yes. Not, 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 not my cup of tea, right? So, all right. I think uh, we got one more? Oh, so he talks a little bit about, like, you know, what gets into it. We'll leave that for the CPA tonight. And, uh, yeah, we can go a little more there. And uh, we got to talk golf carts, right? The g in Florida right now. I'm, I'm, I'm punting on this one. This is all you, man. No, just real quick, I just, that's the little, that's my Lambo. That's what I work for, right? <laughs> Whatever your picture is up there, make your picture. That's what I always wanted to do. I mean, there's only there's only three kids on there. That's pretty good. I had to get a six-seater. The insurance on this thing is crazy because it's street legal, so I can go on the road. I mean, that's what I wanted. That's my lifestyle. So put a picture. Get a vision board. Get it up there. Keep it in your mind. Know what you're working for. Um, 
I don't want the Lambo. Actually, my, my 13 year old says, Dad, when are we going to buy a Lambo? My wife's like, What's a Lambo? I'm like, Let's, let's not go there. <laughs> it's not important to me. It depends on whatever's important to you. That's what you got to work towards. So, um, yeah, I love it. I love this thing. It's great. Yeah. So, you know, guys, we went a little long tonight. What I really enjoy is interacting with folks. And if you have a question, don't be shy because another guy's going to have that question, another gal's going to have that question. So, love to do a little Q and A if, if anything came up because I know a lot of guys are in, in the fix and fix, uh, fix and flip space, doing uh, you know uh, things like that rehab. So, love to get into it. And uh, we got you right here. What's a good deal for you guys? What are you looking at? Cap rate, cash on cash? Like so so when we when we first got into it, it was like, I'm not buying anything less than an A-cap. And, you know, we had to get real because the market has shifted, right? So if, it, if realistically now, we're probably targeting more of a 7 cap right now, and we're still looking for anything north of a 9% cash on cash, we're actually looking at a deal right now, and I haven't seen anything this good since 2014. And typically, we talk about the mom and pop apartments. Okay, we got into some other things today because we wanted some, you know, fresh information in case they look at a lot of guys that listen to the podcast. So we're looking at a deal right now, and it really reminds me a lot of a deal we did in 2014. We we got into that deal at 30 30,000 per unit. Okay. Rents were extremely low. We, we got in at that time at about an eight cap. This one's actually shaking out probably more like a six, but at the end of the day, the market rent in the area is more like 800, and it's not typically our play because we really do try to buy in actuals, but I know from doing a market research, getting on a rental meter, going to drive comps in the area, we're gonna drive this thing to about $300,000 a year net, and that's, guys, I don't know if you guys are in it, for 130 unit comp, uh, complex, that's a monster. Okay, and uh, so it's look. Every deal's a little different. Everyone has their own parameters. I don't really think I'm going to be going below a seven cap, and that's why we got a team in place to really get out there, find the deals that actually work. We're hitting probably two deals a year right now. I want to get that to maybe six to ten, and as we start to scale it and grow, so it's it's a personal question. Are you going to syndicate? Are you doing it yourself? What's acceptable to you? For me, I really don't want to go below a seven cap. Uh, it's not easy to find, but uh, you know, I think we've in the last. Say 12 months, done about four deals, so not bad. I'd like to ramp that up a little bit, but I, you know, since I since I started with this guy, we've done about average about two a year. So, is that fair? Yeah. That's good. yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's on the ring. Yeah. Go ahead. Just talk about your um, initial story. You said you were working full time at a pharma company, and then you were doing uh, the repositioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, the really cool thing about my job was, and, and we have another uh, person in the industry, is that it gives you a lot of flexibility. So I was fortunate that I'm on the road a lot. And I may be driving for you know 20, 30 minutes at a clip, and it gives me the opportunity to, if I gotta call this guy, if I gotta make some phone calls, network with brokers, or hey, I'm gonna meet a broker for lunch. It was basically whatever it took because, look, I was in a position where there's something called the Sunshine Act. I know you're familiar with that. The industry was starting to really compress. And I was literally waiting by the phone every year for six years. It was sit by the phone, and we'll tell you if you have a job or not. That's awesome, right? Love that. You know, so I was like, look, I gotta make a move. So my first move was to Tennessee, and the second move was to start my own business. So it was like, I did whatever I could. If it was, you know, working nights, weekends, and it's like this. You guys are all here tonight. I think that shows a willingness to do whatever it takes to get out of what you're in, so you can become financially free. And it's real. And and for me, it was putting work in, whether it was you know, 18 hours a day or whatever it was for about a three-year stretch, to tell those guys I'm good. And I brag on this all the time. I was able to fire my boss at a Taco Bell over a chicken quesadilla, and it was probably one of the best moments of my life. And I love the chicken quesadilla, not because of that. It's delicious, but I really like that. That 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 was a big moment for me. That was a big win. So were you a rep here in New York while? So I was, yeah. So I, I literally so grew up in, in the Rochester area. My wife was uh, she was born in Staten Island, so we moved over to this side of the state. I was working in White Plains. Uh, mainly and uh, doing some cardiovascular stuff and then uh, you know really started to hook up you know with Gino right before the end and the guys that, that, that I saw that I was like you know he was doing good his brother was doing good they're, they're paying you know 25 35 40 thousand dollars a year property taxes and I'm like how is that sustainable I was making maybe like 100k as a rep that's fine or whatever I was like a 25 year old dude but where, where are you gonna go from there if you if you really want to you know live a, you know, like a fulfilling life take care of your family be responsible you're not, you're not doing that by being like the guy at the end of the corporate whip where yeah, this week we think we're good with you, we're gonna do away with you, right? And, and I worked my fucking ass off, right? Fuck that, okay? So, you know, I did not want to be a part of that anymore. And, and you know, fortunately I found an, an avenue to get out of that and, and really take more control of my destiny rather than, you know, letting someone else dictate to me what's gonna happen in my life. 
that that was probably more impactful. This dude's creeping on me. Come on, man. Three things. Another trending. You need structure. You need discipline. And you need focus. I think that's all you need in life because you have the structure. We have the framework that we figured out. You need discipline because, like you said, I was working 60 hours a week. I need to schedule my day. Schedule your day. Start a weekly thing. We have Monday morning huddles. We do stuff on the weekend. He spends two hours on Sunday figuring out what he's going to do for the rest of the week. It's a lot of work, but you got to put work into it. Your weekly wins. We celebrate our weekly wins together. It's a lot of fun. You know, I give him shout outs. Josh gives shout outs. That's what's really important. Think big, but start small. I think that's really important. I started up in Rochester in um, 2008. I was buying duplexes. I bought a couple out there. I felt comfortable. I learned how to manage the manager out there. I was sharing my limiting belief by saying that I can do it. Problem was I couldn't scale up there. That's the problem. I didn't like the market. Market demographics, one employer, you know, Section 8's not bad, but there's just no job growth up there. It's just depressed up there. And I wanted to get out of New York. The property tax, like you buy a $50,000 house, the tax at three grand. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's crazy up there. So I couldn't scale. So, you know, that's, that's I guess, to answer your question. But you really need to structure your day, figure out what your goals are, like I said, and you really need to work on your week. And like you said, those half hours, chunk it out in the morning. Read the book Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. Great book. Um, it's called, it's got the Savers acronym. Start doing that every morning because the morning is when you have a lot of energy. I was a night guy, but morning you have a lot of energy. You focus on and you get your day going off right and you start with your wins and celebrate your wins and share your wins because we're taught not to do that. We're taught to be humble and I'm a pretty humble person, but when I do something really good, I want it to know and I want it to share it with me because it'll really invigorate me, really get me going. No more creeping. That's it? Did we, we hit it all? Awesome. Okay, now we're back. How do you find out what geographical area is good done? Geographical area, yeah, no, so so there's a there's a very uh, we stumbled upon it kind of thing. Uh, happened to be in an area where there was good population growth. It was one of the, the uh, was a number three area in the entire U.S. that came out of the recession at the time. So for myself, it was really just dumb luck, right? I'm not going to say that we're the smartest guys and we've done everything because we we went and crunched the numbers. Not true. Happened to move to the southeast, no doubt. You look at Texas, you look at the southeast, that's where people are moving to, that's where their job growth is. And so we got into an area that's just, you know, I moved there and, you know, every like five miles, there's just a, a duplication of the same franchises, same thing goes in. There's fields, literally, when I first moved to Knoxville, and now you can't even touch that area because there's Kroger's, there's Chick-fil-A, it's just booming. And it's, it, there's construction, there's job growth. I'm not even talking about Nashville. You can't even touch Nashville. So for us, it was dumb luck. We stepped in it. But I truly believe the southeast is the area right now to invest. Okay, And it's because that's where the jobs are going. That's where the population growth is. Fortunately for us now, we're looking at and we're, we're strategically positioned in an area where we can touch Kentucky. We can touch, uh, we can touch Atlanta, which is right below us. We can touch Chattanooga, Nashville, Carolinas. And I would love to own assets in any of those places. And it's, it's due to those factors. Good population growth, good job growth, and... Uh, and look, we're not rocket scientists. If we see a Kroger going up, we see Chick-fil-A, we see Starbucks, we're probably going to get interested in that area. We're not looking for war zones. If there's a, uh, a manufacturing plant, you know, we, uh, we, we, we have a, a complex that's 136 units. We call it Denso Apartments. Denso is a manufacturer for Toyota. They create a lot of parts for Toyota. These, these folks screen their people extremely well. We own 136 units next to them. We know when a person comes from Denso, they've been pre-qualified. They're making at least $15 an hour. Give me some more, give me some more, give me some more. We love those folks, okay? We do what we can to keep more of those folks. We work, we work very closely with their HR. And uh, so that's that, that's sort of it. It's not not like data scientists, okay? It's not, it's, some of it is just, you know, it's there. You, you, know, you take advantage of it. <laughs> those assets aren't going to reset like they are in California because California's going to get whacked. There are three caps. I mean, they're going to get whacked. <laughs> LeBron left, dude. It's over, okay? <laughs> But my point is, what's your strategy, right? My strategy initially, why I chose Rochester was I want as much cash flow as possible, and that's a linear cash flowing market. Same thing with Cleveland. But then met him, and I said, hey, I got somebody boots on the ground. That's why I chose Knoxville. So um, a lot of markets are expensive, like Florida, parts of North Carolina. What is your tolerance for cap rates? Do you want to pay a five cap? I mean, I can get into like something called a risk premium, where the risk premium is the difference between a cap rate 
and a 10-year Treasury bond. So the risk premium 10-year T bond is what 2.93 percent. If your if your cap rate's five and the risk pre and the 10-year 10 bond is three, the risk premium is only two. That, that's a lot of risk. That's a lot of work for only you know two. Because if you put your money in a 10-year T bond, there's no risk in that asset. But real estate there is. So the other thing is also at a five cap, doctors and lawyers are buying. We didn't talk about why multifamily is so hot. Forty billion dollars a month are coming in from Europe. Australia has one and two caps. Where that money going to? It's not going to the stock market. It's coming here. Europe's money's here. Venezuela's money's here. Brazil's money. They're all coming here. They're all chasing yield, and that's what's driving multifamily. So you have to figure out what your strategy is. And no, no, we just talked about partnerships before, right? I have no idea what he just said. Like that's like that's that's fine. The risk premiums over my head, but that's why it's important to you know partner with smart guys, right? At the end of the day, that's a takeaway there. So. I don't. I got the risk premium, dude. I'm sorry. No, no, I don't get it. It's over my head. Well, back in 07, so if we if we see history, back in 07, that's what happened. All the smart guys saw risk premium dropping. Cap rates were compressing so much, and the 10-year T-bond was so much higher that guys just knew they knew when to sell. Right? We don't want to sell. We bought right. We didn't over lever, so we're trying to hold on. But that's smart guys. Picking on the G-bit here. Yeah. Yeah, we had another one over here. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, I heard that Gino was saying that I think. First deal was maybe a fourplex or a couple duplexes, um, and I, I know some people here probably have had their first deals already. Some haven't. I'm just wondering, what would you say is the maximum amount of units you would recommend for a first deal to kind of learn? Jake, I can do that. Let me, let me. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take this in the walk over because he started. <laughs> no, it's okay. But like, we, just to be very transparent, we started with 25 units together as a partnership, and and, and that was fine. We learned to scale quickly, but I know he started smaller, so I think it's a, it's a good one for you to answer. Wherever you're comfortable, right? Uh, I love Jay Scott. He's going to be presenting our event. He's been on our podcast a couple of times, and he hit, did something to me. Told me people do either zero deals or they do a lot of deals. They don't just do one deal. So it's all about momentum. It's all about being comfortable. Don't listen to Grant Cardone. Go big, think big. It's tough to say when you have seven thousand units. And I would never tell anybody to do that. I would say choose something that you're comfortable in. Get in. Everyone I hear says the proof of concept. I don't even know what the hell that means. Proof of concept is proof to yourself. But that's what you want because once you become comfortable and become competent in something, you get really good at it, you enjoy it, then you're going to succeed. So I don't think the size I really has anything to do with it. Just jump in it. I mean, if you guys were out there, the FHA loans, 3% down, get into a duplex, that is awesome. I wish I had done that. I didn't do that. You know, wish I had done that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's not um, can you talk to us a little bit about finance? Can you talk to us a little bit how you finance that first, uh, those first deals, let's say that first 25 unit and the next one? Yeah, so you know, I was joking around on that a little bit, but really uh, organization is key. And, and I think being a, a person that, that, that you're going to prove yourself to the bank or the broker. And so, and uh, we, we got the Jaybird earlier, he didn't give a little shout out here. Anybody that wants to get something, it's called a credibility book. Um, you know, go ahead and, and, and give Josh your email later here. We'll, we'll, we'll send one to you guys for free. We created this on our first deal because one of the hardest things in the beginning was we didn't have credibility and brokers didn't want to listen to us and I always say this, y'all are never going to do a deal down here. And we, that's real. We heard that and guys were hating on us because we were trying to put in offers that actually worked. And you know, you got the, these two guys from New York and it just, it was a little, there's a barrier to entry. It was just leave it at that. Okay. But when it came down to it, we actually found a deal. What did we do? We worked closely with the broker and, and we said, look, what do you think the bank's gonna wanna see? Because we wanna put a business plan in place to show why we're the guys to close this out and to leave like nothing on the table. I don't wanna leave that meeting with the bank and have any like doubts that this guy's gonna close. So I talked about my background. You know, been in corporate America, did these like regional development training programs, got an MBA. You know, none of, that, none of that stuff mattered, but it showed that I was a dedicated guy. Talked about his experience, talked about his balance sheet, and literally slid it across the table, presented a book, which was essentially a business plan, on why we were the guys to close the deal. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a million, it was a $600,000 deal, right? Basically. Uh, uh, GDS calling for the ball. Hit him, hit him. I'll go through the numbers, because the numbers really, um, 600000 80% bank financing. We got a 10% seller financing on our first deal. So we were able to actually find the broker who knew what seller financing was. We educated the, the old people are motivated and we came up with 10%. So it was uh, $83,000, 10% of uh, 600,000 was $60,000 plus another 23 or $24,000 for closing costs it was 83,000. We split it three ways, me, him, and my brother because you know, bigger brothers gotta take care of little brothers. And you know, that was tough. I, you know, I, 
I want to help my brother. I wanted to, but I wanted to split up. I wanted to split away from him. But, you know, I just, my dad told me, you got to take care of your brother. And, and I continue to do that. Um, and, you know, the great thing about it is he wants to sell the restaurant. Now. He wants to come work for us. So, I mean, I think it's awesome. But, so $83,000. So we split up three ways. The second deal, we got our fourth partner, which is Mike, um, came on board. It was an $850,000 deal. It was 36 units three months later. Like I said, the momentum boo. So we needed to come up with 15% uh, on that. We got 15% down on that deal. Uh, community bank, but we got crappy terms. We only got a three year term on that. We didn't know what we were doing. We were making mistakes, but you fall forward. You lean in and you figure it out. Um, we came up, we split that deal four ways. The third deal, uh, a year later, was a $4 million deal. Um, it was 136 units. Like I said, just those baby steps, 25, 36, 136. That one, we needed we needed a bigger nut. So Mike actually lent, we came up with 15% down. He had 20% of the deal, I had 35% of the deal. My partner Mike had 45, and my partner Mike was generous enough to lend us $500,000 to the business because we knew we were gonna refi it. We took $50,000 and the broker held his note for $50,000 because the deal started at 6.5 million. I offered 3.7 on the first offer. Everyone thought I was crazy, but that's what it was worth. And there's no such thing as a low ball offer. If you do your actual numbers, if you send the numbers in and you can justify it. So it went down to 4.4 million on the first shot. Then to get it down for another $400,000, because my partner Mike, he's a hedge fund guy, so he looks at the numbers granularly. So we'd almost lost this deal for 50 grand. Me and Jake didn't have 50 grand. So we we told the broker, he'd done a couple of deals, can you hold it note for 50 grand? We'll pay you, you know, 500 bucks a month. After 18 months, we refied that deal out. We paid Mike back his 500 How much grand. Did we refi that one out for? Um, the first refi was a million yeah, six. Park place was right? Park, yeah, a million six. So 18 months later, it was worth 6.5 million dollars because we had taken it over. It was doing 53 thousand dollars a month. We had gotten the revenue up to 85 thousand a month. So we refined that property uh, in August of last year. Uh, we refined and pulled out another 2.2 million on that deal. Same deal. Revenue is over 108,000 a month now. So cap rates, see the great thing about it, like I said, we're lucky. Cap rates are falling, our NOI is increasing, and we're still at 75 to 80% LTV. So the thing is like the partnership, that's why I'm passionate about partnerships, because I give Mike all the credit in the world. If he was here, I'd give him a ton of credit because his balance sheet allowed us. He had faith in us. I proved the model. I'm a pizza guy, I had all sauce. Hedge fund guys, he starts talking to me about China and gold. I was ready for the opportunity. I, I knew what I was talking about. He found faith in me, and he's buying single-family homes in New Canaan, Connecticut for $4 million and not cash flowing. And he's saying it doesn't work. I said, I have a better strategy. So he tried us out, and he, you know, and that's the, that's the history, so. Yeah. Does that so, answer your question? Absolutely, thank you. So, so let's elaborate it a little more, too, because it's, it's for me, it was beg, borrow, and steal. That, was, that deal was the one where I, I borrowed money from my grandparents. You do whatever you could. But then you get in the refi and roll strategy, and you can start doing you know more and more because you're pulling the money out tax free. You're not going out and buying a Ferrari. You're putting it back into the properties. And now you got the connector, the guy that educated himself. You got the you, the bullheaded guy that's putting his head through a door, doing whatever it takes to make sure the day to day is going. And you got the equity guy. And that's why guys, all this stuff that we're showing today is just stuff that we've learned by doing. Okay, we know it's real and we know what it takes. And that touches on the financing piece because you want it, you want an experienced operator, you, you want the, the educator, and, and you want the equity side. And now, since that deal, we're able to basically split them up three ways. Uh, from the equity standpoint, we brought you know Gino's brother, who in the beginning we got him in at ten percent on some of these things, and we bought all our own deals. We haven't syndicated yet. Okay, now let's take it a step further. We want to syndicate now. We want to do a thirty million dollar deal. We want to do a forty million dollar deal. That's where the syndication comes in. We'll probably run a couple through, 10 million bucks a piece, just to you know prove again, prove the model. But then when that 30, 40, you know, million dollar deal comes, it's five, six hundred units, we're gonna have the experience and we're gonna be able to take it down. And uh, you know, that's just the, the evolution of the business right now. Oh, here he goes. Here he goes. <laughs> so that queasy feeling when you get in your stomach, about two years ago, this guy wanted to do a fifty-five million dollar deal. I'm like, where the hell are we gonna get the money? And I was got that. I got sick. I almost felt like thrown up when he told me, right? I got really nervous. But what that did is it pushed me to learn syndication. And you know how I learned syndication? By having syndicators on our podcast. I learned the whole model by by interviewing them. So it's getting out of your comfort zone. You know, Robbins, Tony Robbins says it. The more you can get out of your comfort zone, the more the more successful, the more, more fun, the more fulfilling. If I was stuck in the kitchen, I was not getting out of my comfort zone. So, um, you know, I think that's what it's all about. Valuation, operation, putting in. Do you have kind of like a strong 
value. Yeah, we're not. So the thing is, like, I don't know what the future holds, right? So if we're if we're doing a syndication model, you know, maybe year one because there's going to be some turnover. Maybe we're looking at like a two percent increase, right? But we're never we're never underwriting for more than uh, than like three percent because we just don't know, right? And we're trying to maybe you know look at our previous uh, P and Ls. It's really great the uh, property manager software that we have. It's a couple clicks away. I can pull P and Ls from basically when we started and see what kind of uh, increase we've had on the expense side. Learn from that. You know, typically maybe a point and a half, you know, two percent tops, depending on, on which one and why. Some of that though is not actual uh, expense creep, but it's actually business evolution. Maybe we're we're light on the employee side and had to expand the business a little bit. So we're 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 learning from doing like we've been doing all along, and then we're we're not underwriting really for above three percent unless we know that we're going in and there's a management play or there's a turnover play, we're gonna move the rents a certain amount. That's, that's, basically what I'm saying from that is more of a stabilized approach versus uh, you know going in and turning a, a, a property over because we know that the rents are under market. Um, so we got, we got, we got. he said 15 more questions, so we're about to cut it off. So literally guys, we're, we're gonna be here, we got the guys here, we're gonna take one more and then we're gonna wrap it up and, and, and we love you guys. Here's the first one I saw, just saying, so go ahead man. You guys may have touched on this a uh, little bit already, but uh, I wanted to ask specifically. So, in preparation for the market shift or potential market shift, what are you guys doing in terms of the types of deals that you're willing to get into right now? Yeah. Uh, both in terms of you know what you're looking for in a deal, how you're financing it, and the types of business plans you're willing to undertake. <laughs> Just remember these words: no deal is better than a bad deal. So we pass on we've passed on a lot of deals over the last couple of years, and um, the market is going to have to. I mean, interest rates are rising, but the problem is people are renting. People are still renting. Millennials are renting. That's the problem. You know, ten ninety nine workers. That's the problem. They're transient. So there's the, the, it's weird. The supply and demand is not there. There's such demand for multifamily housing. That's why cap rates keep compressing. So I'm more worried about the economy shifting more than multifamily. Because if the economy shifts, that's the problem. So. We're staying strict for it with underwriting. We're looking for the seven caps. We're looking for the value adds. This deal that he's talking about, it's got $200 a month in rent bump, plus another $30, $40 per month in ratio and rubs bill back. That's huge right there. So for us on our first deal, we have to be successful on our first syndication. So that's why it's taken us so long to do that. So I want Dylan actually to talk about this a little bit because since he's been on, I don't know how many deals we've looked at and it's frustrating as shit because I'm not going in and buying a deal unless it works. And you know, it, it's almost like, I talk to a lot of guys and it's like this pie in the sky mentality, like, is there real deals out there? They are if you're willing to work for them and go find them. And, and literally the, the deal that we're working on right now, I'm not gonna, I just want you to share about it a little bit because you, yeah, yeah. you've been through it with me and you've been seeing shit after shit after shit after shit until you see the real one. And I want you to just talk about how that feels in, in your experience. Yeah. Yeah, so in this instance, we're talking about you know the fact that uh, in the past, we'll say six months or so, I've looked at, uh, we'll say 100 deals, you know, and and in the past two months, we've looked at deals, uh, we'll say you know five deals a week or so, and and uh, so you're you're constantly looking at deals, you're constantly underwriting deals, you're constantly talking to brokers, and it's a game of persistence, right? I really don't think that this business is rocket science. I, I truly believe that this business is simple. After enough time, after enough studying, underwriting can be made simple. You can learn the business. It really comes down to, especially with where we are in the market right now, just a game of persistence because you're going to see deal after deal after deal. You're going to start to question yourself and say, am I even underwriting these things the right way? How are these guys doing this? Are these guys all just jeopardizing you know, their returns to just to get the deal done? And you're going to start questioning yourself a lot. And, and that's why I really, I always will share that you should not be just celebrating just the actual results, but actually celebrating and rewarding yourself for the efforts that you're putting in and the actions that you're taking each and every week, which could be underwriting five deals a week. So no matter how those five deals a week go, you're still happy, you still know that you're doing the right thing because when the deal does come up, back to your point, it comes down to the fact that it feels too good to be true, right? It's, 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 a weird, yes. it's a weird thing because you get there and you're looking around, what's going on with this? How come it's what's not selling at a five right? cap? How come it's not selling at a six cap? How are these returns here? Is it really below market? What do the comps have that this one doesn't have? You know, there's got to be something wrong with it. You really start questioning these things, and it's good too because you want to be a little bit you know, skeptical to some extent. But it's, uh, it, it will be there for those that actually stick with it and are and are persistent. So I think that's what you're getting to. 
And just real quick, I just forgot to mention, back in 08, tons of deals. There was no money. <laughs> now, there's tons of money and no deals. So that's how the market shifts. So, um, you know, uh, I think that's what you gotta worry about. Yeah, the last thing I wanna say on it is don't be so skeptical that when you do find it, that, that you're gonna be like, ah, now nah, there's something wrong with pass. Take the few extra steps, put the work in every week, and, and we speak to, you know, we're on the podcast, we speak to some pretty sophisticated guys that, that you think would have a little bit thicker skin, and, and these guys, I'm not gonna name any names, but they go, uh, you know, I think I know how to underwrite, Ooh, right? And then, then the next thing is, there's no deals out there. Yeah, not for you. We're finding deals, maybe not as many as I want, but it's, it's look, those who hustle are gonna be rewarded. If you go out there, I'm not gonna get into all the different ways that we're, we're, we're trying to create deal flow right now because that may be like a little bit of the secret sauce, but we're doing some pretty cool things and, and we're persistent. So if, if you're willing to hustle, you're willing to go out there and you're making the calls, you're working with the brokers, Look, it may be 200 to one. It may be 300 to one. How bad do you want it? That's the, that's, that's the thing. How bad do you want it? What are you gonna do to go find it? Because there are mom and pops out there that are burned out and you're gonna be solving a problem for them and they're gonna be re rewarding you greatly by turning the keys over to a business that can make you a ton of money and set you up for life. And, and that's, that, that's, that's my take on it. Oh, oh, we got the Jaybird coming in, folks. Watch out now! All right, so I got a little gold nugget for you on this one. So a lot of times if you, let's say we set a goal, six months, I want a deal, right? 18 months, I want a deal. Well, you may not get there, and what happens? All of a sudden, you start justifying, this isn't for me. This is, I mean, they were there. They tell the story. But if I can set my goals of, hey, I'm going to look at five deals a week. I'm going to call 10 brokers this week and focus on the process and the actions and the things you can control, then you know you're gonna be successful, and it's not if, it, it's when, as long as you have that persistence and that why, and that's what allows you to get there. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's spot on. So I think they're, they're gonna start kicking us out of here, but we're, we're, we're here, like we said, we give till it hurts. I'd love to, love to meet some of you guys personally, and uh, really, Darren, thank you so much uh, for having us tonight. Hopefully we brought some value to the folks, and uh, thank you guys. Hey! <laughs>